All right, we might get started, guys. I'm told I tend to talk a lot, so I'm a little bit concerned that I'll run over time if I don't. Um, so uh, it's lovely to be here today, um, certainly uh, here in Melbourne at the Australian Project Controls Expo, and to contribute um, to today's full day of insight and, and learning uh, for both delegates and presenters alike. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I have been told I'm not allowed to walk around or uh, move a lot, um, just in terms of cameras, microphones, and all that kind of thing. Um, so this is to, to stay still uh, for me is also quite a challenge. Uh, so please forgive me if I look a little bit jittery up here today. So I am delighted to speak to you today on two subjects that I am um, very passionate about and apparently can debate quite vigorously. The first of which is, of course, project control systems and tools, and the second of uh, which is the ingredients required to achieve an effective implementation thereof. First, however, when I get these sorted out, a little bit more about me and some of the reasons that I choose to debate these, these topics with such vigour. My name is Loretta Bayliss. I'm the founder and the group CEO of Prescience Group Australia and the very proud recipient of last night's 2019 Australian Project Controls Consultancy of the Year Award. Kudos to my team. Um, they've done a fantastic job to, to lead us on that journey. We work closely with owners, EPC and subcontract organisations to deliver project system success to strategic project teams, both internally and in terms of our clients' dealings up and down the supply chain. Prior to founding Prescience, I was lucky enough to deliver projects both here and internationally in telecommunications, aviation, energy and oil and gas. My focus has always been on the strategic value that is derived from the effective implementation of transformational project control solutions and the allegedly dark art that I'm here to speak with you about more today. But before we explore the nuances of dark art or fine science with more granularity, I'd like to share six key learnings that I've distilled from very many implementations of project control systems and tools. These are my own thoughts, although I was gratified by the similarities in all of the papers I read and reread whilst preparing for today. I and my colleagues are good, very good, at implementing effective project control systems and tools. Yet some of our projects still hit speed bumps, and we've discovered that most of the bumps will be related to one of these six concepts, which I hope you might remember just one or two of when you leave here today and how we've helped to address them. Number one, begin with the end in mind. Number two, ask the silly questions and communicate the answers well. Three, don't eat the whole elephant and definitely do not eat the elephant whole. Number four, complexity is overrated. Testing and retesting of systems, tools, processes, and the way that they work together is not. Number five, don't be too busy to celebrate with your team. And number six, above all, being right is not necessarily always the right answer. Keeping these in mind, I do actually have a more structured agenda for today. First, we'll work through some common definitions and context, and then move to the why of implementing effective project management and project control systems and tools. Thirdly, we'll address some of the critical elements for successful project systems implementations, and we'll tail off with some common pitfalls and how to avoid them. As with every paper I present, even in knowledge areas such as this one that I'm pretty comfortable in, I do augment my own views and sometimes highly subjective opinions with a pretty solid body of research. I was disappointed to find, though, that as I was researching for this paper, and in many of the articles I've worked through in recent weeks, they were focused on project failure, pitfalls of poor project management, the pain of poorly or inconsistently defined processes. Research related to the holistic implementation of innovative, effective, and integrated systems and tools to support project management through project controls seem to be either non-existent or a carefully guarded secret or dark art. 
but certainly not a success-driven or replicable science. Great projects are driven from science, discipline, and the creation of absolutely repeatable processes, non-software systems, and software or application-based tools. I'm a strong advocate that the science of projects is in the systems and tools, whilst the art is very much the leadership, the people, and the problem solving. And it is this symbiotic combination that creates effective implementations. It is this combination that allows us to consistently and successfully embody Winston Churchill's famous words. I like things to happen, and if they don't happen, I like to make them happen. So let's use, during this presentation, some of the fine science, dark art, tips, tricks, and techniques that we have all used at different times to build a stronger picture of successfully implementing project systems, project controls, and the associated tools. So let's start by using some terminology that we all understand. I'm not going to preach to the converted and attempt to teach in the next 20 minutes what project controls is all about. But let's at least agree what systems, tools, and implementing effectively mean in the context of this presentation. Project management systems are the processes, procedures, and organizational structures that work together to remove ambiguity about how project work gets executed, recorded, measured, and reported. Project management and project controls tools include the software, devices, forms, etc., that help to make the execution more accurate and efficient. And implementing effectively combines all of these to create a project controls ecosystem that supports, encourages, and enhances the project team's ability to meet project program portfolio and strategic outcomes as expected. Effective project systems and tools are hence much more than just installing the software or commissioning a cloud or SaaS subscription or even re-architecting an out-of-date or clunky process. Yet with the pace of change in the current project landscape, systems without tools and vice versa offer only a partial solution. According to Longman and Mullins of Kepner Trago, Project systems software, although a superb tool for organizing and presenting project information, is not a substitute for project management or project control skills or the judgment required to apply them. The joint purpose that effective controls and its supporting set of systems and tools serve, of course, is to deliver successfully on strategic and operational initiatives. The organization's strategy should provide the boundaries for projects and it's widely recognized in the Australian market that superior project management and controls, the skills and the innovative systems and tools that they generate create an important competitive differentiator. So just as you would if you are founding a new company or establishing a brand new PMO, implementing effective project management systems and tools starts with knowing what it is that you actually want to accomplish strategically and how you want the selected systems and tools to help you achieve your vision. Phil Bertolini, the CIO of Oakland County in the US, offered similar advice in the CIO magazine a few years ago, suggesting that when you start to look at different systems, tools, and applications, make sure that the functionality actually meets your process needs and overarching goals now and into the future. Look to the future when you select your software and tools, he says, not just at the dollars and cents. So in addition to it being one of the seven habits of highly effective people, beginning with the end in mind starts with ensuring that you've actually defined what success looks like and what your goal is. PMI's 2017 Pulse of the Profession report states that the definition of success in projects is evolving. The traditional measures of scope, time and cost are no longer sufficient in today's competitive environment. The ability of projects and project systems to deliver what they set out to, the expected benefits, is just as important. 
So understanding the goals, outcomes, benefits, and strategic alignment does then cascade down to some of the more operational early stage decisions required in order to ready your organisation for the change that more disciplined project controls brings, and subsequently to vendor, partner, and product selection processes. This isn't just about the actual decisions you need to make on these things or the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve, but also on the internal stakeholders that you need involved and require the support of, the project culture you're seeking to embed into the process, the style of relationship that you want to foster with key external stakeholders as well as internal ones, and of course, your selection and functional criteria themselves. The answers will be different in every organisation and as we see across every industry. But they will be the axis on which you build and to which you return when critical issues arise during project execution. For the purposes of today, I'm going to assume that you guys have got a lot of those processes down pat. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the technology side and part of systems and tools and building now with the future in mind. So I don't think there are going to be too many surprises that my advice is to carefully consider the outcomes that you're looking to achieve from technology and the context that your solution needs to operate effectively in. I was listening to the BAE presentation earlier um, and they list one particular set of technologies and tools that they always operate with and yet those same outcomes will be delivered by a completely different set of tools in a different organisation. So this is not tool or software specific but they are a set of recommendations that can be applied across different technology sets. So it's also not about the form, steps, buttons, screens, or functions that you'd like to have. It's about what the technology will enable and support in your organisation, and how well your organisation is going to be able to integrate it and embed it into your operational and capital project delivery DNA. Each of the bullet points in this one and the prior slide, there was a lot there, so I'm clearly not going to be reading those out to you um, point by point, but each of them are worthy considerations and influences to the selection process. Good planning for effective implementations takes time, and consideration for these will enable a far stronger and context-appropriate selection at all three levels in terms of outcomes, the behaviours that you're looking for, and the functions that you need to achieve. It can also be helpful to identify, having reviewed the project success and history of success or failure within your organisation and experience, particular recurring problems that you might have seen across different implementations. We'll talk more about avoiding pitfalls shortly, but by objectively recognising where those issues exist, you can potentially address these in your visioning requirements and planning for your pending implementation by focusing on those elements that exploit your strengths and obviously mitigate your weaknesses. Technology is by no means a silver bullet, particularly if it's implemented in isolation, but it is absolutely an enabler. And if you have begun with the end in mind during your concept and early planning stages, you are already on the path to success. So now that we've set the stage for success, we can start to explore some of the characteristics of actually implementing effectively. The five that I've chosen to focus on are very much vision, simplicity, preparation, execution, and governance, or the G word, as I heard it referred to earlier today. And those are the five that we'll focus on a little bit more now. We have already spoken about the strategic and outcome side of vision and beginning with the end in mind, but there is more to vision and successfully achieving it than a fabulously articulated statement that sits in an executive sponsor's head or remains only in the opening statements of a project management plan document. Vision is also about defining a far more granular level of success, how we measure that success both qualitatively and quantitatively, not only at the project's completion, but also throughout the implementation process. It's about having executive and operational stakeholders who believe in, advocate for, and support the intended project and project system outcomes. 
It is about communicating with clarity to each team member and intended solution recipient the value that the project outcomes are intended to provide to the organisation. Reduced cost, improved efficiency and increased visibility are the catch cries of new technology implementations. Yet genuine buy-in and benefit will result from digging deeper into the what's really in it for me, really, and investing the time in understanding, driving and communicating the benefit at all levels of the prospective solutions audience group. So simplicity, simple is as simple does. I'm sure that's what they say. My view, 100% wrong. Appropriately simple is the core concept of successful and effective implementations. Simplicity is a key principle that we adhere to at Prescience. Not all things are simple, unfortunately, and some things should not be made falsely so. Yet seeking greater simplicity in order to avoid the unnecessarily complex is a mandate on every single one of our projects. Solutions that are easy, logical and intuitive to use, that make sense with every step, that automate where sensible and only where sensible, and which save us time, stress and effort, are the ones that we're all willing to proactively try, willing to actively adopt, and willing to advocate and champion to our peers, colleagues and stakeholders. It just makes sense. They are also the solutions that at an organisational level are more easily transferable to and learnable by new team members, more consistently applied across projects within the same organisation, and they generally exhibit more agility and capacity to support change as processes are renewed, improved, or retired within your organisational context. Always attempt to deconstruct the overly complex process and re-architect it with simplicity in mind. Preparation, and this is one of my favourite bits of this presentation, sorry. Winston Churchill and Benjamin Franklin are two of my favourite historical characters that I would have loved to have had the opportunity to meet. Both understood and practised the art and science of careful preparation and exemplary execution. I think you would all agree that in the context of capital projects that we're all operating in, no project will succeed without a realistic and thorough plan for that success. It is in planning for and preparing your project that you will need to make clear decisions about such things as approach, regulatory and industry compliance, depth of required testing, level of business and operational involvement, skill of your team, outsourcing, as well as existing organisational capability and capacity. Planning itself is simply working through what needs to be done to create success. Risk planning and how to treat those risks is also a core component to support effective implementations. One of our key learnings during the preparation and planning stage of every project is to determine and agree a number of strategies to stay true to scope and to appropriately address scope creep, new requirements and non-mandatory functionality as they arise in the planning stages and not later in the project when it occurs. In the planning stages is when you need to define how you are going to handle those things because they will occur. You need to be clear with all of your stakeholders as early as possible that scope creep in IT and project systems projects is a near given if you allow it to occur. And how you handle it collectively can drive success or failure. This is good scope governance. But it's also a good reminder that to achieve a successful outcome, we need to break the outcome down into bite-sized chunks and work packages, and also determine which of those packages are truly in scope, and which one of, can be actually relegated to a later phase. The default position, in my view, and I'm apparently quite autocratic about this, is that if it's not clearly specified as in scope, then it is out of scope until a variation declares it otherwise. But execution is where the real fun starts. 
This is the part of the project that I tend to enjoy the most. Many project control systems, tools, and solutions are now available in the form of cloud, SaaS, prepackaged, commercial, off the shelf, any different number of combinations, which require configuration and occasionally customization in order to meet your organization's requirements. But just because it's SaaS, COTS, or configuration based doesn't mean that it's risk free. Far from it. Continuing a robust process of risk assessment, mitigation and management through execution is mandatory, as is adherence to a robust and effective test strategy that tests systems functionality, off-system process integration, and non-functional technology requirements, such as data access, security, and performance. To share just a few of the nuts and bolts of our execution process, at Prescience, we have six steps that we will follow through every single execution. We call them, number one, commence and confirm, number two, architect and design, number three, configure and construct, number four, validate and iterate, number five, deploy and deliver, and our sixth step is to operate and enhance. These are supported by project management, change management, risk and governance frameworks throughout the project. All of them, every single phase within those six stages needs to be implemented well in order to achieve an effective implementation overall. Execution phase reporting is also an area that I believe requires focus from every implementation team. Glenn Allerman asked the question in one of his Liquid Planner uh, blog posts about project failure. How long are we willing to wait before we find out it's too late? Many of the stories regarding schedule percent complete versus a wildly differing physical percent complete. We were even talking about it at dinner last night. Additional baselines being taken to skew reporting outcomes to a more favorable position. Effective execution is about reporting progress accurately and transparently even when it's not the message that management wants to hear. Effective execution requires well-trained and disciplined project leadership and implementation team members who exhibit an intense personal courage to communicate honestly, openly, and transparently with their own team and also with internal and external stakeholders, particularly when things deviate from the planned and the expected. Longman and Mullins of Kepner Trago state that projects are incubators for the development of future leaders, especially when these projects have strategic implementation implications. Every project should be a platform for learning and growth. I wholeheartedly agree. This is a great segue into project controls governance and its criticality in implementing effectively. In layman's terms, Governance is the management framework within which project decisions are made. In this way, an organization will have a structured approach to conducting both its business as usual activities and its business change or project activities. Far too often, adherence to and operating within agreed governance frameworks and disciplines is inconsistent, especially when implementing project systems. It is, however, a process that supports structured analysis problem solving, communication, and decision making, and encompasses all project implementation phases and stakeholder groups. Air Commandant Terry Saunders of the Australian Defence Force shared a lesson in governments in a recent forum in Canberra last year, which reflects what many of us will have experienced in different projects. Effective project governance requires regular, non-advocate assessment of project performance to counter the risk arising from reduced objectivity and increased optimism by line management. I smiled when I heard it. It's imperative to have a project sponsor. It's also common to define a project leadership team, a steering committee, and a series of project champions or business reference groups, all of which have really clearly defined roles and responsibilities and through whom success is measured, progressed, and communicated. In all of my experience, and all of Prescience's experience, and in the collective histories of everybody in this room, I have no doubt we could compile a tome on the many and varied issues that have befallen us over time. I would have to say, however, 
that the absolutely most common issue we witness is that of the unspoken issue. Poor communication is often the fall guy in literature and anecdotal stories, with which I disagree. It takes a very astute individual, project team member or stakeholder, to effectively, consistently and artfully not communicate what should be said. But for reasons truly confounding, it is still often what remains unsaid that is often the real issue. Pip Marlowe, current CEO of Salesforce here in Australia, said only yesterday morning, the biggest communication problem is that we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. My recommendation for addressing this is simply to ask questions. Sometimes it is the seemingly silly ones. Listen carefully to the answers. Don't ask questions because you need to know the answer. Ask questions because you're looking for the pattern or the trend that they're going to tell you all about. I found it incredibly useful over the years to apply my ability to do puzzles and identify patterns to my project updates. And anyone who's worked with me for an extended period knows that they need, prior to coming into any level of governance or update session, to try to figure out in advance what questions I'm likely to ask, what patterns I will be focused on for that particular discussion, because they know that when things don't add up, I delve deeper. That's not to say that I've got all of the answers or all of the information, but I am seeking a consistent view from multiple stakeholders and to understand the variances and the underlying rationales. Inconsistency tells a powerful tale. The next most common pitfall we see is that of perspective. And I've actually skipped ahead uh, here um, because when I saw this, it reminded me of a particular stakeholder I was dealing with at the time. Um, she was nearly always right, but I can guarantee in my own way I was nearly always right as well. And, um, and they're the twain we're going to meet. Um, so the two conflicting views that taken in isolation are both absolutely correct. As I said, I've experienced this from both sides. When I was younger, um, and sometimes when I'm older, um, being the one who was always right, of course, and more recently with some of those particularly challenging stakeholders in large project environments who sometimes know no other way of operating. In their experience, there is no option. And although prescience and, and my own experience brings extensive industry experience and 10 score great implementation supporting our view, both groups sticking to our position in a particular negotiation is not gonna generate an appropriate resolution. Taking the opportunity to walk a mile in another stakeholder's shoes is one of my most common pieces of advice to our team and to truly seek first to understand the basis for another's position. Being right simply isn't always the right answer. There are a myriad of other issues, but I would nominate the following repeat offenders as the next most common. First of all, insufficient testing of systems, processes, and technology. Um, I come back to the poor mechanics of scope governance. I can talk for a long time about that one. Uh, sporadic, irregular, or unstructured risk management. We've addressed in quite a lot of detail, the first and the third, um, the first being addressed by strong and multifaceted testing strategy during the execution phase, and the third through structured risk management and governance, which leaves scope governance. And I can't quite be silent on this one just yet. It's the elephant in the room that we've already talked about. But unless the requirements analysis was comprehensive right at the beginning of, of your project and prior to project start, scope is incredibly difficult to manage. Don't feel bad because you're experiencing scope creep on the project that, that you're delivering at the moment. It is natural and it is right for every client to want the absolute best system that they can get, um, the absolute best outcome that they can get. But bring it back to time, scope, cost, and quality. And somebody has to be prepared to make those decisions. It's really important to have that default position on scope and scope governance defined early in your project. No Moscow. Implement it religiously. Begin with the end in mind and remain strong with respect to your outcomes, timeframes, budgets, impacts, and not 
eating the elephant whole, are themes that I'd encourage you to clearly communicate with your stakeholders. So implementing effective project control systems and tools. We come back to our, our six learnings from the start. It is both an art and a dark science. It is one that requires strong leadership and disciplined application of project and implementation knowledge and practices in order to find the right balance and equilibrium and to steer your project to an overall outcome-centric success. That's all I have for you today and all I have time for, but I'd be happy to take questions if we have time and look forward to catching up after this session, if not. Hi. Many uh, systems, project mm -hmm. management systems. How do you deal with the fact that you're, the people you're delivering it to, although they knew exactly what they wanted when they started, mm -hmm. through the process of your implementation, they have learnt a great deal more, mm -hmm. and so now they know they want something not the same as what they started with. Mm -hmm. And when, if you carried on delivering to the the scope that they gave you, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? Um, I think it's a tough one. We generally, from a, a systems perspective, start with some enablement of our stakeholder groups. So I think it's natural that whilst you don't know what you don't know, um, you, you do need to learn and improve during that process. But a lot of it comes back to the way that we define um, particular outcomes as well. So what we find is that a lot of requirements are drafted in the form of, we want um, three clicks to this or we want a button that does this, or we want F9 to do this. Um, and so if we move away from defining the requirements in, in that respect to something that is more outcome driven, so what do you want to achieve with that? What is the, the report structure that you need to be able to drive? Because that will enable us to see how we're going to capture the data, uh, for example. Um, are both really good contributors to it. So defining the requirements and, and working through that requirements process really clearly is probably the first way. And the second one is to provide some insight and knowledge about stuff that we know they don't know. Um, so generally we've done this enough times now that we can pick a lot of the stuff that they're not gonna know and, and give that to them early to say, look, we just want you to think about these things. We'll come back to you in a week and, and let's revisit it then. Um, but there will always be some stuff that, uh, there's stuff that we learn on projects still as well that a client will come to us and say, well, actually, I've played with it like this, and we can do this. And you sort of go, huh, wow, that's very cool. Um, and so sometimes there is a, a bit of horse trading um, to make that work. Um, but generally, it, it comes down to what's the intent of the outcome, what's the intent of the agreement, and um, generally, hopefully, leaving the contract in the bottom drawer and, um, and ensuring that there is an outcome on both sides of the equation. Um, how do you handle change management uh, when you're dealing with a customer who is very immature and you're mm -hmm. uncertain they um, have a structured process to make sure organisationally they can uh, achieve success? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I think the, the best example I can give, and anyone from my team in the room will know exactly who I'm talking about when I share this anecdote. Um, we had a, a key stakeholder, uh, probably about 10 years ago, fortunately, I'm hoping he's changed since then, who sat there and looked at me and said, change management, why do we need that? They'll do it because I bloody well told them to. So, okay, that's one approach. Um, and definitely not what I would incorporate into either project management or change management 101 um, by any means. Um, and so we actually started um, with, with that team um, from just looking at it from a skills perspective, to say, all right, let's 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 avoid some of the, the core change management stuff and look again at what you're wanting to achieve. And what he wanted at the time was that he had too many um, operational issues not being communicated for so long that they ended up being mini explosions 
and he had to deal with all of them. Um, so he was too senior in the organisation to be doing that. And what he wanted to see was a, I guess, a roll up of there's some stuff that his supervisors should have been able to handle. There was some stuff that their line managers should have been able to handle and some stuff further up. So we ended up defining a reporting structure that we could walk through with him to say, in terms of the timing, um, the data that we're going to provide through these reports and the exception-based uh, reporting, we should be able to minimise the number of issues that come to you in the following ways. So if you can define change management in terms of how it's actually going to help your least mature stakeholder um, and give them the what's in it for me, it suddenly becomes a lot easier um, and a lot more appealing for them to contribute to and support doing that for people in their organisation as well. Um, it, that is different, and I would say that is definitely part of the art of both change management and project management, is being able to read your stakeholders, uh, be able to know them well, um, but also be able to negotiate a path that is going to define a good outcome for them personally. And there's actually a, um, it's actually a relationship management um, learning set that I've put my, most of my team through in terms of even when you're looking at a professional outcome, there is always a, a personal win um, in everything that people do professionally. If you can find that personal win and, and what is going to help that individual, it will help you craft a, a more robust change management strategy overall. Mm. Excellent. Those were two great questions, so thanks, guys. Um, so if, certainly if there is any other questions or if you think of anything after this, um, we do have a, a table down in the exhibition space. Uh, you're welcome to come and say hi. Um, and I think my details are actually there. You're welcome to give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, it's great to be here. <laughs>